Well, hello everybody, good evening. Um, yeah, welcome uh, to this uh, last uh, square table from uh, Nuria and Isaac organized for this year. Uh, yeah, this is the last uh, last event from uh, a sequence of events that we had uh, uh, and organized uh, by uh, you as the volunteers. So thank you for that. Um, as always, we'll start with the housekeeping rules. Um, we're using Teams, so if you have any questions, just uh, put them in the chat or raise your hand uh, virtually. Um, and then one of us will be able to unmute you so you can ask your question directly to the presenter. Um, as most of you know, is always if you dial in, uh, make sure that you have your first name and last name uh, inserted. Uh, yeah, otherwise, we won't be able to know who you are at the end and we won't be able to distribute uh, the CP points to you. Uh, for this for this last uh, webinar, we have uh, uh, two presenters, uh, Roberto Martinez and uh, Nicholas Palmer from the IB Group. It's an international security group uh, is operating globally. And for this webinar, they're presenting uh, yeah, an, a, a true story for one of their cases that they had in which they did an, uh, an investigation for a large fraud security uh, uh, case within the Netherlands. And they were able to do uh, research and have led to their exposure. So, yeah, from my perspective, it's a very interesting story that we'll have for the last webinar. So, uh, Nicholas and uh, uh, Roberto, I would like to give yeah, the word to you. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, of course, uh, Thank thanks to the, the organizers and everyone here for, for joining us. Um, so speaking now, uh, Nick Palmer, um, I lead the Global Intel Outreach Program within Group IB. I'm joined by uh, one of our head researchers within our European office in here in Amsterdam, uh, Roberto Martinez with the beautiful mustache. Um, and uh, Roberto, if you want to fire up our slides, because I think you're going to be controlling them today, then we can yeah. get rolling. And, and we see them uh, yeah, we can we can see them just fine uh, now. Um, I want to start slideshow. Cool. Yeah. So um, today, what we're we're going to cover is is exactly what was introduced. Um, really, part of the reason why Group IB launched a headquarters here in the region was to be close to um, some of the law enforcement agencies that we work very closely with, like the Dutch High Tech Crime Unit, um, and also with EC3 uh, Europol, um, and to do fun investigative cases that are making an impact to the European region. And this one just so happened to be uh, Dutch actors um, targeting Dutch citizens. So it was a really fun investigation. And Roberto and I will cover uh, both the technical investigation into the, the phishing in infrastructure and different panels. Um, and then I'll cover um, a little bit about the investigation in collaboration with law enforcement uh, as well. Um, so uh, I'd like to actually provide you a little bit of information about Group IB. Um, so uh, if you've not known anything about us, actually, uh, basically everybody within Group IB um, holds within their heart that they're cybercrime fighters. Um, we really believe that every action uh, conducted online, malicious um, or, or not, is, is typically initiated by human. And um, as a company that started an incident response, um, you know, we hold this very near and dear to, to, to our hearts and uh, really like to investigate and analyze cyber criminal activities. Um, so that's kind of where we started. Um, now um, the Netherlands has welcomed us uh, here in Amsterdam. So we opened up our office about 12 months ago now um, and have uh, both myself and Roberto um, are here in the Netherlands. We also have our, our global headquarters in Singapore. Um, and have done a lot of things, as you can see, since uh, 2003. But uh, among them, and, and very importantly, is collaboration with uh, with law enforcement. Um, we also have many different technologies as well. That's not really the point of today's conversation. But if any of you have interest in, you know, incident response, in threat hunting, in anti-fraud capabilities, or threat intelligence capabilities, we have many different training courses and things like that that are free of charge. And of, of course, we have different solutions as well. If if you run an organization and and would like to know a little bit more about some of those. Um, in terms of collaborating with law enforcement, um, we've been working with uh, Europol EC3 for uh, geez, about six, six years now, I think, almost, almost seven. 
Um, so uh, we've been frequent visitors to Den Haag uh, previously before moving here. And uh, you can see two pictures um, uh, signing our MOU with Europol and also with Interpol. And, you know, we couldn't ask for better partners within the law enforcement segment uh, because at the end of the day, we get to do fun stuff <laughs> like this. Um, you know, here are a few examples of uh, actions that we've done with various law enforcement groups. Um, we did a really fun um, carding action together with Europol uh, last year and this year, uh, saving European citizens over 40 million euros um, and providing that data to law enforcement. And actually, we're going to talk about the bottom left hand corner <coughs> investigation today. So maybe with that, um, you know, Roberto, you can kind of take over and start the uh, initial uh, introduction to the story, and then I'll continue with the investigation into the actors. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Nick. Uh, so let's uh, get into the this story that we're bringing uh, today. So 2020 was a, a bad year in terms of increased cybercrime activity. Uh, with the start of the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdowns all over the world, two scenarios were created. First, an increase in the number of vulnerable people, people that are more prone to fall for a scam uh, or a phishing attack. The second scenario was an increase in people that lost their source of income or that just couldn't find a job. So they started looking for an easy way to make money and fast. The Netherlands was not a, an exception to this, and the result was a rise in phishing attacks targeting Dutch and Belgian residents. So. <clears throat> And Fraudsters, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Roberto. Yeah, yeah no, you, you, you go, uh, Nick. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, fraudsters use many different types of, of vectors to reach potential victims. Um, you know, it can be email, text messages, um, you know, even, even WhatsApp, etc. cetera. Um, in this specific case, um, they used uh, different messages with malicious links leading to phishing sites. Uh, that were used to steal personal information and also banking information. But the goal was always the same um, for the fraud family, and that's really to, you know, obtain victims' bank account details uh, for financial gain for themselves. Yeah, and helping to fuel this increase in phishing activity in the region, we find uh, this Dutch-speaking criminal group, the fraud family, as they call themselves. The fraud family not only rented and sold sophisticated phishing frameworks to other cyber criminals, but they also went a step further. They developed their own framework and tailored it to the needs of the ever-growing community they had created. So to put things in context, phishing frameworks or live or dynamic kits, as they are also known, allow attackers with minimal skills to optimize the creation and design of phishing campaigns. We will see later on other advantages these kits have over more common and simple phishing kits over uh, yeah, the, the ones that are not uh, dynamic. Uh, this group chose uh, Telegram Messenger as their platform to advertise and distribute their products and services and to provide support to the clients. So this question started to take place in multiple Telegram channels, both public and private, and the increased popularity led way to position the fraud family as a major enablers of cybercrime in the Netherlands and Belgium. So uh, let's take a look at a couple of methods attackers are following when using the fraud family's tools. Yeah, the first method uh, works like this. So we have an attacker that sends potential victims messages through email or SMS and they're impersonating some popular Dutch brand. The recipient opens up the message containing a, a believable lure and clicks on, on a link, which leads them to a phishing site. This phishing site was previously crafted and customized using a management panel, which is part of the framework. And this panel is also used to interact with the victim through the phishing site in real time. So the fraudster uses the panel to request and obtain banking and personal information from the victim. And with this data in hand, the attacker can then access the victim's bank account. Here are some sample of uh, messages being sent to the victim. In this case, it's a local company connecting home seekers with a housing supply that is being impersonated. 
after accessing the link in the message, victims get presented with a phishing site that asks to pay for a small fee. Uh, here, the victim can select the bank, and then a site impersonating the selected bank is shown. Uh, in this uh, slide here, you can see all the lures being used, like government services, package delivery, or even uh, online uh, market marketplace, uh, marketplace. And speaking of this, the other method used by attackers to the fraud victim is related to this. So let's uh, take a look with more detail. Yeah, here it is. In this method, a seller posts an item for sale on the marketplace uh, platform. A fraudster finds this ad and then contacts the seller showing interest in the item being sold. At this point, the fraudster moves the conversation to WhatsApp and asks the seller to verify themselves just to prove they are not a scammer. To do this, the real scammer provides a fake payment request for one cent, uh, a very small amount. And when the seller, now a victim, tries to pay the small amount, they get presented with a phishing site like those seen in the previous slides. And from here on, everything goes the same way as with the other method. Here you can see a phishing site impersonated in uh, Mark Platz and the different Dutch banks that the victim can choose from. And here you see a phishing site mimicking uh, one of the banks, and another bank, and another one. Uh, all the popular ones are there. So one of the features that makes Dynamic Kits so attractive is the ability to defeat multi-fault authentication. Basically, the web panel interacts in real time with the phishing site. Data obtained from the victim is sent to the panel, and the fraudster can ask for any additional information that they may need to get access to the victim's bank account. This includes personal information, multi-factor authentication tokens, or even home Wi-Fi uh, wi information. While the phishing site waits for further instruction from the fraudster, the victim is looking at the screen uh, with a please wait message, like this one here. Now let's take a closer look at the different panels that were distributed by the fraud family. Early in 2020, the fraud family started distributing a modified version of a very popular framework and call it NL Multipanel. Then by the end of the year, the group started advertising a new lightweight framework that was optimized for mobile use. Uh, it is known that many Dutch cyber criminals use their mobile devices to connect to web panels and to manage the phishing campaigns from there. This live kit was called Express. Then, in the spring of 2021, the gang started to promote a shiny new framework, one they were proud to call their own, and it was named Reliable to honor its developer and leader of the family. So let's now have a look at some monetary aspects of this enterprise. Here you see a price comparison between the three panels being used. In the case of uh, the monthly subscription, they offer full support, everything you need to get the campaigns going, say a domain, hosting, and infrastructure setup. But a more skilled fraudster could opt to just buy the framework and do everything themselves, saving some money this way. And now let's look at some numbers. Unfortunately, because of its code simplicity, it is uh, very difficult for us to create proper datation rules for the spread funnel. Uh, based on the source code, so we cannot provide an accurate number for it. But in the case of NL multi-panel and reliable, you can see how much popular the reliable panel got. Okay, so let's uh, see more technical details about these panels. One of the features that makes dynamic kits so attractive is the ability to defeat uh, multi factor authentication, uh, I already mentioned. So, uh, <clears throat> Basically, uh, yeah, it's uh, the victim is looking at the screen and the attacker is asking for any information they need to to get access to a bank account. And this uh, dynamic kits allows that. The first one, the NL multipanel, is uh, based on on you at me, and uh, it was customized by the fraud family members to fit the the Dutch cyber crime scene. It uses a couple of plugins. One is token and the other one is opanel, which allows uh, for this uh, live uh, real-time interaction with the victim. 
so it basically bypasses multi-file sort of authentication. No, no matter if you use a QR code or SMS-based token or a hard token, uh, the attacker would just ask for that information and use it while the victim is still looking at the phishing site. <clears throat> so after signing in into NL multipanel, you get presented with this welcome screen that gives credits to some members of the family, including Reliable. And this is uh, the tokens plugin. Here attackers can see if somebody is currently on the phishing site and if victims, victims have provided any information. And if uh, you click on the O panel button that you see, well, it's a bit small, but there is a button there to the right of each entry that says O panel. So if clicking on that will present uh, a new window showing the this plugin that looks like this. And here is where the fraudster can interact with the victim. And you can kind of see to the to the right all the operations that can be performed, including asking for any additional information that that may be needed to access the bank account. And of course, this operation can be fully customized by the panel's operator. So they can add uh, uh, new uh, questions to ask to the victim. If, uh, for example, uh, the banks make some modification to the code, they can modify that here and uh, keep getting the information they need. Let's jump into the express panel now. Uh, this framework was not advertised for long. And although we still see it in use from time to time, it is not as popular as the other two. These images show the admin interface of the panel, and they were taken uh, directly from one of the public channels managed by the Fraud family. Uh, by the way, they show two different versions of the same panel. And this image here shows a phishing site targeting Belgian residents. And Although I said that it is difficult to create uh, detection rules based on the source code, you can still uh, detect them by a very particular uh, URL panel they used. I'm not sure if uh, you can see it there in the presentation, but uh, there is a index exclamation mark TRXID that is a dead giveaway that someone is using the Express framework. <coughs> And now we go to the third framework, the Reliable Panel. It was created in parallel to the Express Panel by Threat Actor Reliable. And although it makes its public appearance in November of 2020, it kept a very low profile until the spring of 2021, when members of the Fraud family started advertising it heavily. It was uh, developed from scratch using a different scripting language than the one used to build NL Multipanel. It is also faster than NL Multipanel and all its variants, but equally flexible and customizable. And of course, it allows the operator to interact in real time with the victims. In fact, and, uh, uh, we, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Roberto, I thought you were finished that slide. I've just been asked to monitor the, the chat function and there's actually a question for you. So maybe you can advise on it. It says, how yeah. difficult is it to be aware of this phishing site if you're lured into it? And can it be seen from the URL? Uh, yes, yes, it can always be seen from the URL. So you will see uh, whatever domain the attackers are using, and uh, they always follow a, a pattern in the URI that can uh, tell you that you are interacting with uh, this uh, any of these uh, uh, frameworks. Yeah, does that answer the question? Yep, and there's actually a second Thanks. question. So what scripting language is used? So we'll try to work all the questions you guys uh, have. Yes, into yes, no problem. So with NL Multipanel, um, they used uh, PHP. And with uh, I'm not exactly sure with uh, Express, I think also uh, PHP, but with uh, Reliable, they're using uh, uh, ES Node. And then there is some PHP in the background. All right. And any any other questions? Seems like not at this time. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, continue then. So uh, one interesting thing that this with the reliable panel was that they removed many of the witnesses that you had had or has because it still has it. But more importantly, they crafted it for the Dutch and Belgian markets. So we actually saw them asking questions to their the member of the groups. 
So what do you prefer, this and this? How do you like it? What, what would you like to see? And then they build it based on that feedback from all the cyber criminals. So it was uh, very uh, customized. After signing in, uh, you see the dashboard of the panel. It shows some stats. Uh, to the left, you have a menu that is showing the different operations that can be performed. Uh, first in the menu is a uh, request. Here, the fraudsters can customize their campaigns. They can select the lure and a unique token value that will be needed to access the phishing site. This way, they make sure that only victims can access the site and they keep unwanted visitors like uh, security researchers away. They will need this value to, to actually access the, the site. Otherwise, uh, you get redirected to Google. Next in the menu is logs. Here, the attackers see who is on the phishing site and if it is a bot or not. And do you see that value after the uh, URL? It's uh, it says the URL and there is uh, like X value there. That's the randomly generated token that I measured in this uh, previous slide. Um, and by clicking on the blue uh, small button there, the attackers can open another window where they can interact with the victim through the phishing site. And this is what uh, you see. Uh, the red banner tells the attacker that the victim is still connected and the phishing site is waiting for further instructions. So uh, now that we know everything about the phishing operations and the tools being used, I would like to then invite Nick to share inner details about the fraud family and, and the investigation that was conducted. Cool. Thanks a lot, uh, Roberto. Um, always fun to listen to you speak and uh, show the work that uh, you and the team have done. Um, so I'll actually cover the investigative aspect that our team uh, worked on in connection to the fraud family. Um, they're pretty uh, sophisticated in the tools that they made, but I think what was most unique about the group um, that we've seen is the way that they uh, made their uh, services available for lower level fraudsters during the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, it's obviously not unique, but um, definitely in the way that they organize things within Telegram, they managed to acquire a large number of uh, additional fraudsters that were targeting uh, Dutch institutions. Um, all of their phishing pages impersonated well-known <clears throat> local brands like uh, Roberto said, market plots, and many of the regional uh, banks as well as uh, government institutions. And they all used uh, regional payment mechanisms uh, to continue to, to lure their victims. Um, the availability, the local approach, and the use of their panels um, definitely make it um, a serious uh, cyber criminal group for the region. Um, and the local clients that we have here in the Netherlands uh, definitely um, confirmed that they saw a significant uptick um, during the activity of the fraud family. So for us, it was clear that uh, monitoring and responding to particular phishing sites alone wouldn't be enough to resolve this issue. And it was one of the reasons behind us in, uh, initiating an investigation into local phishing and one of the most in advanced uh, cyber criminal groups that we've investigated so far, the, the fraud family here in the, in the Netherlands. So let, let's try to understand basically um, the surface of the threat and look at you know, how the group appeared and how they evolved as, as well. So what we did was actually you know, go back to the beginning of the activity in 2018. And this was really our first signs um, in May of 2018. Uh, when some Dutch uh, speaking cyber criminals actually purchased you admin from a developer on exploit.in. Um, then the, the phishing panel business moved to Telegram, uh, where Dutch speaking threat actors started actively advertising phishing panels uh, in local fraud and cyber criminal related groups. Um, and then, really, since 2018, the number of, of sellers and, as a result, cyber criminals using these panels has really increased uh, dramatically. Uh, U-admin phishing panels have become well-known uh, product amongst mid-level fraudsters. Uh, it's tracked by many security researchers, but U-admin still requires uh, some technical knowledge to actually utilize it. And that's obviously likely why uh, the fraud family started to 
modify their their panels and to to sell them via their uh, fraud as a service model so in in february of 2020 the first phishing framework advertised by the fraud family was detected uh, which was an L multi-panel which uh, roberto described previously and this is where really the um, increase of the group uh, began so after about a year, the source code of uh, NL Mall panel was leaked um, and a number of different fraudsters simply rebuilt it and started uh, advertising the same panel really under their own brand. Um, but Fraud Family didn't stay on the sidelines, even though it got released. So they brought uh, two different new panels that Roberto described, Express Panel and Reliable Panel. So. These were really completely new solutions, easier to operate for lower, lower level or lower skilled fraudsters and harder to detect. And that made really the fraud family a success in terms of fraud as a service in the Dutch speaking uh, cyber criminal market. So really from, from April to July, phishing panels were, were at their prime. Um, and therefore the fraud family in terms of the money that they were making, um, and at that time, it was clear that, you know, we needed to up the ante in terms of the investigation and, and mitigate this issue. Um, let's take a, a closer look at their, their business in, in more detail now on the, on the next slide. Um, so it, it's actually um, not one uh, Dutch speaking cyber criminal community, but uh, it, it was a group of actors. So we have five different uh, group members. Um, in total, there was over 2,000 different subscribers to the Telegram uh, groups and channels that they had created, and approximately 150 of them were actually distributing um, uh, fraud as a, as a service to additional consumers of that. Um, the monthly income, although this is kind of hard to uh, justify and is usually on the low end of the scale when we get the, the figures from our analysis, was about 40,000 euros per month. Um, again, during the height of their activities, which was really fraud, uh, a, a, a April to, to May of this year. Um, so, But what really made them so dominant? Um, we think it really comes down to, to three things. We think uniqueness of the phishing panels in terms of lower detection probability, um, lower entry, so making it easy and scalable to operate this business. Um, you know, a lot of the consumers of the fraud families panels don't need deep technical skills to perform their attacks. And of course, it's a service model. So uh, you pay money and then you can conduct fraud and then profit from that. So there's a clear return on their, their investment. So these are really the, the key factors that made them you know, one of the, the most dangerous uh, fraud gangs for conducting fraud within um, uh, the Dutch, uh, Dutch industry at the point in time. So now uh, let's take a look um, at the structure of, of the fraud family. Um, the main developer and the main act, actor um, is, is reliable. So he was responsible for uh, development and group leadership and also uh, modified U admin panel into multi-panel. He's also the developer of reliable panel. Um, we also have a, a secondary actor within the group as well. Supposedly, he's the um, responsible party for reselling the panels, distribution of ads, and the related fraud channels. Um, but uh, these uh, sellers on the bottom left-hand side are simply reselling and don't really play a significant role in the investigation that we'll tell you about. So the whole family was quite skilled. They worked hard to keep their family business, let's say, away from prying eyes. But uh, really, in the end, uh, we were successful in our investigation. So let's take a deeper dive into the investigations process. Um, and really, on the screen here, every criminal leaves a trace. Um, this is entirely true, um, that there's always digital traces that allow us to get deeper into the investigations process. And... Uh, review actually how um, we concluded the investigation and what led to criminal arrest. So to do that first, um, let's dive a little bit into the, the start of our research. And that was in the phishing pages and the admin panels. Um, so initially it was uAdmin um, based framework, but we managed to observe the administration interface and uh, using different techniques, we were able to get access to the administrative panels. 
Um, the interesting thing here is that uh, fraudsters commonly believe that they need to actually test their phishing pages on themselves uh, before sending them into the wild on using them on different victims. Um, and these guys were, were no exception. Uh, they tested uh, their attempts and it y yielded quite uh, interesting results for us. Um, actually able to identify IP addresses and u user device information as well um, uh, when we got access to the panel. So um, additionally, some of the panels being used by the threat actors um, contain some undeclared features. And uh, thanks to the development of the, the phishing kit developers, uh, they left behind these traces and we were able to observe the logs in the SSH sessions. Uh, which allowed us to, to monitor the current connections and the admin part of the panels. And this was really a great source of information about the cyber criminals behind uh, the phishing pages and allowed our investigation to continue. So to di dissect the uh, infrastructure a little bit deeper, uh, we extracted the source code of several different panels. Um, uh, source code analysis confirmed that the original panels of NL multi-panel um, which was the original, was developed by uh, uAdmin, and the original actor behind uAdmin is actually Cactus. Um, in addition to some of the artifacts from Cactus, we also uh, identified some Telegram accounts, which were apparently left by the sellers, likely to promote or to get clout. And of course, we followed that trail into Telegram. And this is where the fraud family conducted its business. So this was a, a treasure trove of in information for us. Um, so the Telegram usernames, uh, as I mentioned, were, were definitely key, but we didn't know anything about the entire group at this point in time. So in such cases, you know, when we're, we're at a uh, standstill in the investigation, sometimes one of the best sources is actually the cyber criminals themselves uh, to, to tell the story. So um, with some social engineering, we actually started to um, have a communication with the threat actors and the results were actually quite interesting. The cyber criminals started to literally tell us uh, the whole story about themselves. Um, actually uh, engaging in the information, we got information about the panels, uh, the types, the versions, who was selling it, uh, what were the prices, how uh, fraud service worked, who was the main developer. And we also got some insights about relations with other members. And you can see some of the communication points um, between the actors here. So with a bit of uh, investigative uh, tools and, and activity, we also managed to obtain information about IP addresses, geolocations, and the devices that were used. Um, so at this point, we were, we were pretty sure that the group was organized group behind the phishing panels, but we still needed to get a wider picture of the fraud family's activities and in, obtain inf more information about the, uh, the threat actors. And this on the next slide is actually where telegram monitoring came in really handy and, and made a big differences. Um, we reviewed uh, all of the 22,000 messages um, to identify more information about these threat actors. Um, and it painted really a perfect picture of where they advertise their products, um, how they conduct customer support, um, even discussions and, and questions related to the fraud family. Um, also, the group membership gave us some unique insights on their interest and even locations. Um, we were able to confirm that um, one of the leaders is interested in software development. And for the second threat actor, we were able to confirm based on some of the local groups, as you see here in the bottom left hand quarter, uh, local Utrecht channels. Um, so based on some of those uh, activities within Telegram groups, uh, we were able to uh, pinpoint uh, some of the activity related to where the actor lives. So monitoring the related groups and, and chats more deeply, um, we definitely got a lot of information about their internal structure, but we needed more information on the people behind it. Um, and for that, we um, you know, continued with investigation in Telegram and even acting, asking some of the actors. So you can see actually some of the communications here uh, between us and the, the threat actors, um, uh, trying to get more information about their activities, their roles, their possible locations, even ages. And even in the case of the main, de main developer, uh, they decided to share a meme 
which was also a, a useful sh- a source of intelligence about his identity. Um, that wasn't a meme that we shared. That was that was him. I assure you. Um, so let let's uh, go back to some of the mistakes that the cyber criminals make. So um, sometimes we track threat actors for a very long time, but you know ultimately they do make mistakes in uh, information they leave on the internet. Um, some of the group's members made a lot of them. Um, for instance, one of the main uh, actors in the story actually complained about customer service from a hosting provider and they u- they used for their uh, malicious uh, infrastructure. And actually in one of the private group uh, Telegram, um, he's shared a screenshot of an email with an old ticket. And using this information, we were able to understand more about this ticket and obtain details about the infrastructure that they were actually utilizing within this hosting service. Another really big mistake that they made was actually posting a a screenshot of a successful uh, Bitcoin uh, transaction or cryptocurrency transaction. Um, As some of you may or may not know, it's not the best way anymore to illicitly hide financial flows because everything is is possible to investigate. So, you know, I know it sounds uh, simple, but Finding those silly mistakes for our investigations team is sometimes identifying a needle in a haystack, but these were some of the data points that certainly made it worth it. And mistakes like this um, by cyber criminals provide small but really important pieces to the puzzle that we were trying to put together the complete picture uh, on this cyber criminal profile. So finally, at the end, we were able to connect uh, all the dots. We compiled detailed profiles on the main threat actors, starting from only domains and nicknames. We were able to collect all kinds of data about their possible locations, ages, interests, IP addresses, devices they were using, and other information, um, which allowed us to actually end uh, end the story here. And of course, um, ending the story is is not really possible without um, you know the close collaboration that uh, that we receive from partners like uh, the Dutch uh, National High Tech Crime Unit um, and Europol. So, um, big shout out to uh, to their activity in in the uh, in in the efforts to have the fall of the fraud families. So. Um, the result of the joint collaboration uh, with the Dutch High Tech Crime Unit was on July 20th of uh, this year. Actually, two young uh, cyber criminals were apprehended by Dutch law enforcement um, that were developing and selling this uh, phishing uh, panel and activity. Um, the police managed to uh, seize their uh, devices, took over control of the channels related to the syndicate, and uh, for now, uh, the fraud family uh, has fallen. But uh, what started with really detecting phishing sites concluded in, in the arrest of uh, one of the region's most uh, prolific uh, fraud groups that we've seen in, in some time. And um, it was uh, a really fun time to actually uh, investigate uh, step by step into everything about the fraud family and, um, and bring them to justice uh, together with some of our law enforcement partners. Um, is the story over? Um, I think the story is 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 never really over. You know, the disruption of the fraud family's operations really can open up opportunities for other cyber criminals to follow in their shadows. Um, and as we've seen time and time again, you know, as you disrupt one group, another may come in. But certainly, messages like this make it make it possible to disrupt their operation. Um, So with that, I'd uh, like to say thank you very much for joining today's session. And certainly if you have questions, uh, Roberto and I would be uh, would be happy to to answer them. Uh, One comment sounds like big fun. It was a a lot of fun. Uh, There's not much profit, let's say, in investigating cyber criminals and working with law enforcement, but it's a lot of fun for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, uh, thank you for uh, for the presentation. Um, yeah, it was really great. Um, it feels like you're watching like uh, uh, an, uh, an example that you have like in, in the '90s. You had these crime crime investigation programs on the television, and they they gave a good presentation about how to how did they catch the murderer or the uh, that the, the the person did the crime. However, yeah, now we're lo- we're in the future, and now instead of we're looking at a fingerprint on a gun. 
we're, we're looking for uh, mistakes people are made of uh, placing their ticket of uh, at their hosting provider in a, in a screenshot. So that's really fun to to that that is the new the new technique of finding criminals. A question that I have is basically. Uh, how do you work with law enforcement? Because you do have like a jurisdiction that you're not always allowed to uh, get certain data, for instance, the ticketing system of, of, of an hosting provider. Are you able to get a warrant or how is your collaboration then with Interpol or Europol or with, with, with the Dutch police force? Do you make agreements in advance with them uh, that you can get this data very quickly and, and smoothly? Or, or is it a very bureaucratic process before you get this data? Um, so certainly, uh, cyber criminals use this fact that borders exist to their advantage, right? Um, and I think that's why we work with many different law enforcement partners. Um, you know, Europol has obviously fantastic reach and frequent frequency at which they do investigations and arrests, but sometimes uh, involving partners like Interpol, where they might uh, be able to leverage uh, policing agencies in other regions is really valuable. Some policing agencies have uh, different sharing agreements set up with private uh, enterprise companies that help with investigations. Some are better better than others with 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 information that they actually share back. Sometimes it's nothing that they share back. Um, so it all depends on the, the situation uh, that you're investigating and. Um, yeah, which which law enforcement partner and uh, intel sharing frameworks that they have uh, with private industry. So it, it varies definitely uh, between law enforcement partners globally. Yes, thank you. Perhaps Rinus, uh, yeah, I also know that your question, perhaps you wanted to ask your question directly. That's kind of a cool question, actually. Are you not? A, uh, there's one more question in the the, the chat. Are you not afraid by publishing details um, how the cyber criminals are are caught, um, so other cyber criminals would uh, avoid these uh, these activities? I don't know, Roberto. You wanna you wanna answer that, or you want me to? Uh, I can answer, and then you complete. Uh, well, basically, we uh, interact with them. Uh, they need to sell. They're selling a, a product or a service, and. So they need to talk to somebody, and uh, that's where we come. And the other part is, um, yeah, you can make it hard to to detect the infrastructure or to track it, but uh, infrastructure is uh, is there, is public, so it can always be tracked. Yeah. And I think maybe I read the, the question differently, so I'll read it how, I'll answer it how I read the question. Um, I like, uh, immediately I started to think about Cobalt. So Cobalt, if you remember, was a, um, not Cobalt Strike, but Cobalt, the uh, financially motivated threat actor group. Um, they used to target financial institutions um, and try to conduct attacks against ATM systems or card processing systems and things like that. Um, and we once published a report where we identified how we were tracking the creation of their SSL certificates so we could identify newly created infrastructure from this group. And of course, they, they changed their, their, uh, their techniques and we lost visibility. But uh, I think it's a balance between not sharing anything and sharing, and, and sharing something. Um, so we share various levels of information um freely and then you know uh, in private sharing groups like with fsi sac or uh, global resiliency federation or, or things like this or um so i think it, i think it's a fine uh, fine balance between what you share and and what you don't share but with certainty cyber criminals read blog posts and uh, reports as well so there's definitely a possibility that you'll lose visibility for sharing how you're tracking the group yeah, but it also adds to the challenge. So they uh, evolved, they changed uh, TTPs. So we have to evolve too, find uh, new uh, tracking techniques, uh, develop new tools, and the phone continues. Absolutely. Yeah, never ending cat and mouse game for sure. 
Um, there's another cool question about the tools that we use for investigation. Uh, I don't know if Roberto, you want to talk about uh, some of the tools uh, from a trashing or investigation perspective? Uh, yes, I use a web browser, uh, <laughs> Telegram, and uh, we have uh, some very uh, cool and uh, unique uh, in-house tools that uh, many of them, I, I don't even know how they work, but they work very well. <laughs> but yes, they use a lot of uh, uh, passive DNS information to, to track uh, domain, domain names and infrastructure. And we also leverage uh, some of the tools that are out there, like VirusTotal, URL Scan, very useful tools because uh, everybody's using them. And uh, we collect information from, the, from those tools and analyze it. So, yeah. Definitely. Um, bum, 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 bum. Is, law enforcement, is law enforcement able, based on these results, to investigate the user of these users of these services? Um, I, I would think there's certainly a possibility to identify the consumers of uh, these services. Um, I'll leave that up to law enforcement to tell when and if they can about investigations that may <coughs> may be ongoing, but. Uh, with information, it's possible to to do that certainly. Yeah, so um, actually, when the, if you have the actor that is uh, selling the service, uh, you can communicate with them. But you you cannot usually communicate with the with the actors that are buying those services. But those are the ones you can actually track because those are the ones using the these phishing sites and frameworks. So yeah. yeah the, and there's one more question here, actually. I'm going to throw it at you, Roberto, because it's a tricky one. Uh, it says, I know we were talking about criminals, but generally, uh, how much of OSINT is within legal boundaries and how much is not? Basically, if you found a suspect and investigated him, her, them, and then they turned out to be innocent, the data collected is somehow under GDPR or privacy, even if from a moral perspective. This is the reason to ask this question. So from a more of a, a moral perspective. Yeah, I, I guess so when we collect uh, compromised information, there is uh, uh, not criminal uh, data there. Uh, we, we don't really use that, that information for anything. We don't keep it. What, what we do is we, we pass to our clients what they need to take action and to protect uh, those uh, compromised accounts yeah <clears throat> and that's pretty much it we only uh and go ahead roberto Sorry. yeah not that we only collect like the the compromise uh, account uh, bank account id for example uh but when we are talking about the cyber criminals then then we uh in order to identify them, but uh, then we go a little bit uh, further, try to get as much uh, data as uh, we can get, and then we pass that over to law enforcement. Yeah, and I, I would probably go on the answer to the moral perspective of the question mm -hmm. is that in terms of uh, how uh, we conduct investigations, uh, I would say that we collect the digital traces and the facts and uh, we don't make a judgment to these facts we provide them to law enforcement and allow them to proceed with uh, legal cases um, or prosecution against these individuals so i don't think it's up to us necessarily to say if it's right or wrong or what the uh, penalties will be or etc we just research the cyber crime and the techniques that are used and provide that information to law enforcement as factual information that they can then use to either build a case or, or not build a, a, a case. Um, then we have another question. Sounds like this group had a well-organized setup in terms of IT governance and control. Would be interesting to use their platform or similar and their ideas actively for a pen test like activities and raising awareness. Uh, awareness. Is that something that you do? Um, in terms of uh, like raising awareness uh, about uh, phishing activity, so this was specifically phishing activity targeting 
you know, mostly Dutch citizens and things like that to see their their banking credentials. I think using this as a, a public example and awareness campaign would be, you know, great. Um, we do usually for private enterprise company uh, awareness campaigns that may involve red teaming using phishing uh, activity or something like this. Um, I would say we've never done it at a, a countrywide level, but certainly it, it sounds interesting so long as it was approved uh, and sanctioned by the proper authorities. Uh, but it could be, could be interesting. Um, but I think there's many, many, many cases that can be used in the in the public to uh, to raise awareness. Um, then there's one more question: the development of the panel itself is not illegal. I think were they charged for selling the panel? I'm going to deflect that one to you, Roberto. Uh, no, I guess uh, you can develop uh, whatever you want. The, what is illegal is the use of it, of the tool you developed. Uh, in this case, they were enabling the crime. So it, it needs to be stopped. <clears throat> and they were also using it themselves. So they were also committing the crime. Someone's going to have to watch Rutger on his development, I think. <laughs> so I don't see any further further questions, but if there are any, uh, happy to answer. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I just think about the question. Um, the, they were using the, the panel, the infrastructure, the cells. If they wouldn't, if they hadn't do that, but only developed it and serviced it out, was it then much more difficult to catch them? If they uh, don't sell the, the panel? Uh, well, no, no, if they only did sell the panel and, and, and serviced it, but didn't use it themselves. I have the feeling from your story that, that the moment that they are where they were using it themselves for fishing, that they were giving more away. Uh, I don't think it, uh, it really mattered. Like we were tracking the use of uh, these panels uh, very closely and obtaining uh, information from them <clears throat> and monitoring the all the talks. So even if the they weren't uh, using them, like they were more involved in selling it than using it. Although they did use it, but not very often. Uh, yeah, it, it, it wouldn't make uh, any difference. All right, thanks. And then there's one more question that came through the chat uh, about how many man hours did it take to catch the cyber criminals? Maybe, Roberto, you want to talk to the phishing tracking and, and things like this, and then I'll talk about the investigative aspect. Well, uh, I was actually surprised how fast uh, Dutch police uh, took action. It usually takes months and years, and <laughs> they were uh, extremely fast. We uh, presented the, the report to them, I think, in May, and by July, they, they were already uh, arresting people. So that yeah. was uh, very fast. Uh, for the tracking, we started actively monitoring in uh, April. And so it took about a month for us to, to build the case. Yeah. And... <clears throat> it, yeah, it usually takes about that. Uh, sometimes uh, longer, I've been uh, investigating cases for, for years, just gathering data. But that, that was in a in a previous life <laughs> working for a financial institution, so I didn't have the the contacts uh, we have here uh, with law enforcement uh, here at Group IV uh, make things uh, faster.
Yeah, the question is in Dutch, so it's a bit difficult for you, Niklas, but... Otherwise, Mark uh, Veensa, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask your question directly. I think it's a, a new article of, of legal documentation. I'm sorry, I, uh, uh, I wasn't actually raising the question. I was uh, contributing to the uh, registry remark that, uh, according to Arnold Engelfried, uh, who is a Dutch um, um, a lawyer, um, focused on IT, he posted a topic today on his blog about the PGP phones, and that was basically the same question whether or not uh, this could be considered legal or, or not, because by itself PGP or PGT phones are not illegal, but uh, as Gilbert mentions, uh, the intent does really matter in this case, and Arnold's conclusion was that even though by itself this might not be illegal, it can be illegal because it's aimed at criminal use. So and that's the article in Dutch is what the article uh, Arnold was referring to, why it would be considered illegal. So I was just contributing, not, not, not adding a question. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you very much for the information. I think we have no more questions for tonight then, I, I would say. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, uh, Nicolas and Robert, oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you that you're willing to speak here uh, uh, for, for this audience, for Nuria and Isaka. Uh, yeah, this is the last event, as I said at the beginning uh, of this call, so thank you for that. Um, we will, for the, everybody else, we will have a, a, a minor stop. So uh, for, the, for the next event, we'll be in looking at the agenda on the 19th of January, also from uh, IB Group. So uh, that will be your colleague, uh, Alex, uh, uh, Alex Wells. And there will be a presentation regarding uh, yeah, calculation of the return on investment on uh, yeah, cybersecurity investments. And for us as risk officers and risk management, uh, yeah, that's a nice topic about what is your what is the advantage on uh, the, uh, uh, the expected loss and the expected value of that. So I'm also looking forward to that, uh, to you for the IB group and uh, everybody on the call. Uh, yeah, uh, best wishes for 2022 and uh, Merry Christmas. Thank you. Yeah, Merry Christmas, guys. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Great. Thank you. All the best.